when, when, correct me if I'm wrong, but earlier when you were talking about heckling and booing and how it can be a good thing, I feel like you were talking about it from the perspective of meritocracy and whether it's someone is a, deemed a good rapper or a trash rapper or whatever. Do you draw a line between that and blatantly anti-Semitic booing and heckling? Yeah, because I'll never get booed for being whack because I'm dope. That's just a, <laughs> that's just, that's just a fact. My guest today is the rapper Kosher Dills, having toured the world with artists such as Mattis Yahoo, Snoop Dogg, and Wu-Tang Clan's RZA, to name but a few. He has become a mainstay in the hip-hop world and beyond, appearing on lineups at South by Southwest, Rock the Bells, and the Vans Warped Tour. He is a regular performer on MTV's hit reality television show, Wild and Out, and his songs, in which he draws upon themes of Jewish identity and anti-Semitism, among other themes, have garnered millions of views and streams. Kosher Dills, thanks so much for being here. How are you doing? Thanks for having me. <laughs> it's a great day to be outside. Great day to see you. Yeah, you got a nice background going on. You're in the park. It's, everyone's yeah. feeling good. Um, so let me let me let me ask you. Uh, let's start with your name, if that's okay. Your your sure. rap name, not your passport birth name. Your rap name is Kosher Dills. Yeah. Uh, references your Jewish identity right away. I like it. How did you decide that this would be your name? And was there ever any hesitation about whether you should be so open about your Judaism when you became a rapper? Well, yeah, um, you know, first off, uh, just to, to kind of, the Kosher Dill's name has three meanings. One's obviously like a sexual reference, two is like a business hustle thing, and three is like the Jewish thing. So, you know, I got the name when I was 17. I started out as Kosher Dill. I went to KD Flow. People made fun of me. Oh, Kosher, you know, this is when people really made fun of other rap. Like, you could get booed. I come from that era of, you know, rejection. And now... Um, when I came out with my first record, I really wanted a strong Jewish presence that sort of represented my street life that I was leaving behind and sort of, you know, if I ever became really popular, I thought, wow, it would be like closer to my Jewishness. Um, and Rami is also, you know, an Arab name. So I didn't want people to be like confused by it. And, um, interesting is now, you know, I've really still started to brand my my name, my real name, you know, because it's within the articles and stuff as just my own identity. And, uh, you know, I come from the era where people had rap names, not the real names. So, yeah, yeah. You, you mentioned that you came from this uh, era of rap where there was rejection, where you might get booed. Has that happened to you before? Yeah, uh -huh. a lot. I've been booed a lot in life and I love it. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's sick, but, uh, you know, if you're not good or people don't like you, they boo. And, and I think. You know, we live in a society that's there's not enough booze and a lot of cosigns and stuff that isn't good enough. And, you know, sometimes you get booed and that's OK. It's OK to be booed is what is ultimately my message. And as long as you're trying, you know, and I think that should be more held in higher regard for people trying to, to do things. But in that era, you know, battle, you know, people boo you. And, um, yeah, I've had a lot of booze. Not not a lot in a while. So. <laughs> No, that's hopefully not. That's good. Let me ask you, uh, how, how has your uh, Jewish identity been viewed within the rap industry, either positively or negatively? I think, you know, it's viewed more positively by Jewish, by uh, the Jewish community that's maybe outside of it. I would say, you know, the non-Jewish community, people love it, that I am myself, that I'm unapologetically me um, to a degree. I mean, there's still, I'm very self-conscious about my image, you know, that I put out there and you always kind of wish what you, you always wish you had something that you don't have. And then, you know, people in some regard will say, oh, wow, because you're Jewish, you might have more opportunity. But when you meet Jewish people in the industry who aren't really tied close to their Jewishness, maybe through a last name, maybe through a bagel, maybe through whatever. And it's, I'm, I'm totally okay with whatever your thing is. It really doesn't matter to me. That actually hurts me because, you know, some people think it's there's too Jewish, it's too Israel, but I'm Israeli-American. 
So I just want to be who I am. And not everyone knows that because they don't know my real name is Rami Matana Vinesh. So it's, they think I may be an American Jew um, or I grew up going to camp or, you know, things like that, which is none of that's true. So, right. you know, there's a lot of assumptions when, the, and some are good, some are bad. Um, but better off people to assume something than not assume at all, I guess is the expression, you know. And in, in art, you know, you want to have your name out there regardless of whether it may be good or bad. So I think people, they formulate opinions based on a name right off the bat. Other people, if your name, if my name was something else, just Rami Matana Vinesh, people say, what is that? You know, Koshi Dills, the first question is, oh, you're Jewish? You know what I mean? That's the first thing. <laughs> we mentioned, uh, you know, some people might be like, it is too, it, you're too Jewish, it's too much. I see right now you're wearing a, a kippah. Have you had people say to your face, like, tone it down a little bit? Um, yeah, 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 hundred percent managers, agents, um, wow. that are Jewish. Um, that's okay. Um, I like to wear anything about Jewish, whether I'm wearing a kippa or Magen David or just Hebrew lettering. And for me, I don't yeah. have to wear a kippa every day. I just like to identify as Jewish. That's like sort of my godly tendency, I guess. <laughs> it's like, you know, uh, yeah. you know, so I was thinking about that. I said, what if I just wear Magen David? Cause I used to just wear that. And I said, like, to me, it's the same thing. It's still like identifying so I want to live as people that know that I'm Jewish. I love I love to bear that. So that's going to be either with Hebrew lettering, Magen David, or Kippah. Sure, sure. Yeah. And you mentioned you're uh, Israeli American. I'm wondering what did your uh, Jewish upbringing look like, and what does your relationship with Judaism look like today? My upbringing was, um, you know, Israeli parents were all in. I was all in sports. I uh, wrestled in college all the way from uh, age eight to college, played soccer all the way till, you know, senior year. Um, strength training. So yeah, I started working out in the gym at like 13. Uh, uh, you know, I, I come from a very physical family that was more focused on physical strength and fitness versus, you know, Jewish day camp. Um, we were just traditional, I think, um, you know, we did Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Pesach, things like that, Passover. I th yeah. Uh, you know, and Hebrew school, Bar Mitzvah in Israel, and living in New Jersey, you know, the Israeli family on the non-Israeli side of town, you know. So that's uh, that was my upbringing. And then sort of as I got older in college and, and um, I got actually... Uh, in, when I was in jail, I met my like first rabbi, really. Um, that was like 20, 20, yeah, 20, 20, turning 21. I wasn't like, you know, a new rabbi, but that was like my first time like having like a private meeting with a rabbi, I think. And uh, yeah, and then it just kind of grew with the name as the name popularity grew because Jewish people would reach out to me on MySpace. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, uh, That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, any, anyone who's familiar with you now and, and familiar with that your social media content, it's very clear to see that you are Jewish, and you're very proud of it, and you are not shy to call out anti-Semitism, both in your music and on social media. Mm -hmm. um, have, you, or have you always been vocal on anti-Semitism, or was there a moment later on where you thought, I can no longer stay quiet about this? Um, I just was always vocal about like strong Jewish identity, because some of the earlier people that I looked up to um, were sort of what I embodied as like the Kosher Dills character, uh, was kind of created, you know, as, you know, Rami started rapping and, you know, speaking about myself at their birth, I started rapping in high school and things like that. I was listening to, uh, Ill Bill, Necro, these like hardcore Jewish gangster type, like the Jewish guy of like Sopranos or the Jewish guy of Goodfellas in the Italian film which sort of embodies like kind of like, I don't know, a, a hustling guy, but also like very street savvy and, um, you know, a Bugsy Siegel, you know, something of that nature. And uh, that was combining my wrestling, my rapping, my resentment, <laughs> like all that stuff in life and, and, and sort of by that. And then people were like, why don't you make a song about this? Why don't you make a song about Israel? And then, you know, I got more into connecting to my Jewishness through speaking Hebrew and just, you know, trying to like honor how I grew up in the household with Hebrew. Um, so like, you know, forgetting a language and trying to relearn a language. And it's really communication is probably the most difficult thing in our world, but it's the most simple. 
And, you know, for me, that's, that's like, uh, you know, when people see the Coach Adils thing, they're either going to get something fun or they're going to get, you know, freestyle rap or they're going to get, you know, a cool Jewish spinoff song. And yeah, it's created an interesting life for myself, <laughs> you know, and, and then because I get a platform and, you know, I start posting about other stuff and posting about yeah. anti-Semitism and things I have opinions on and, uh, people like it. Sometimes they like it, sometimes they don't. But there's not much thought into it. I like to speak my mind in many places. Not in all yeah. areas of my life, but in this area, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of what makes good music. Um, you have a number of, of songs touching upon anti-Semitism. In October, you released a diss track in response to Kanye West after he began his anti-Semitic tirade in which over the course of weeks, he said that he wanted to go death con three on Jewish people, denied the Holocaust, openly admitted he was being anti-Semitic, praised Hitler, and so on and so on. Uh, now, your song, titled Death Con 3, a play on what Kanye said, pulls no punches against uh, Kanye, calling him spineless and racist. And you also criticize his fans who will turn a blind eye to his anti-Semitism. What was it like to create a diss track against a fellow rapper for being anti-Semitic, which is possibly a first in rap history? Yeah, it was odd because I don't do music like that. I don't really create music like that, but I come from that, right? So... You know, um, contacted my producer, just was inspired through the people in my life, through a significant person, a really significant woman in my life um, who wrote about it. And, you know, just seeing, and I'm like, I'm not going to touch it. I'm not going to touch it. I'm not going to touch it. You know, it's corny, right? And this is a thought process everyone. And says, like, you know what? No, let's just go full on. Like, I'm going to go berserk. And we're just going to do it. And we're going to see what happens. And if it falls, if it fails, who cares? Because... I've failed my entire career to this point. You know, every time you're doing it, you're just failing forward, right? And you're just falling short of what your goals are. And this thing just took off. It just took off and it just got millions. Even the behind the scenes got millions of views on Twitter, millions of views on TikTok, um, millions on uh, throughout Instagram reels, just all the different pages posting and hundreds of thousands on YouTube and Facebook. And, and um then you're like, oh, wow. And then you're just seeing the comment section. And this is what I speak about booing in real life is that it's more respectful to at least be booed by someone in front of your face than to just get a comment online under a fake page or, you know, a comment section. You can't see who it is because it's safe, you know, and, and it just goes to show you societies. Everyone has an opinion. Um, but, you know, to confront something should be respected, I think, at least, you know, someone standing up with a little bit of moral ground. Um, and my goal was just to make a great song and, and quick turnaround while I understood the topic was hot. And as you see it, like Kanye hasn't said anything in the press. He's been out of it for a while right now. Right. But yeah, so right now it would be too late. It wouldn't be relevant. But from yeah. October through January, Kanye was in the news every day, you know, but you can't be in the news yeah. every day. If you're in this for a long run. You're not going to be hot. You're not going to be hot all the time. You know what I mean? There's going to be downtimes and stuff. And I thought of it as an opportunity to really, you know, flex my rapping skills that I don't really do it that way to curse, to just not think twice and just go and just, that's it. That's what we're doing. It's coming out. We made the video. Goodbye. You know, next. And yeah. Was, um, was Kanye someone that you as a rapper looked up to? Sure. Because I mean, he's very great, creative. He has a great, he's a great visionary. I've been to his events. I've been to his Sunday service at Coachella. I did something called Mozzarella when he did Sunday service. It was twenty nine, <laughs> it was twenty nineteen, and I played, I played Coachella as a guest. So I had front row tickets, and I saw DMX before he passed away. And you know, oh, dude's wow. done a lot of stuff. Kanye's funded the entire DMX funeral and paid for all everything, and um, you know, but. Um, He's somebody that, I don't know, it's it's very interesting the way people have their perception on it. But I got a lot of private messages when I released that song about from people that he worked with, from people that will support me but are afraid to share it. And um, that's just really like, I don't know. It made me look at the world of, of like bigotry and hatred like just differently because um, people are afraid to speak up and, and say things. 
um, only if it's comfortable to them and everyone else is doing it. And everyone was saying stuff about Kanye, so it was like comfortable. But um, a lot of Jewish people weren't, or a lot of non-Jewish people weren't sharing it. And, um, right. you know, like, like Kanye's not going to work with you. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Sorry, you know, but people think they have these things. They're like, oh, right there, you know what? I'm like, dude, yeah. You know? A recent piece of uh, uh, positivity in the rap world, I thought I was quite heartened to see Meek Mill going on March of the Living. Uh, I thought that was a really, a really cool thing that he did. What do you think that was, that? That was, that was cool. Yeah. And, you know, what's really sad is that there's a lot of people that were in the comment section saying, he should have spoke and said something and this. And, and um, you know, he's saying, oh, shout out to Poland. Well, Pol-, you know, he didn't know any better. But, like, when you're at a certain level of notoriety, you doing something is way more powerful than someone's than like a regular, you know, person with um, just just a regular everyday person that's you know um, speaking on it. Like you understand when you have fans across the spectrum that are Muslim, Black, Jewish, um, you know, and also Meek Mill comes from the prison system, right? So for him to go there, it has personal significance, and he's he's not rappers don't speak to iPhone cameras. But just the 11 seconds of him walking there is more powerful than, you know, so much because it encourages other people that are Jewish to go that won't have not gone yet because they have all these feelings. My father hasn't gone. I've been to the concentration camp five, six times already in Auschwitz. And it's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back this summer. It's something I continuously do because it's something I like to pursue and you know to 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 figure out ways to work with people like me you know to showcase that to the world yeah that's something that's like dear to my heart um yeah i think it was amazing that he went yes because people fans of meek mill who may otherwise not really have thought anything about jews or anti-semitism are going to see that and they're going to think oh well if he's going to do it that maybe i should look into this yeah and that could be googling something that could be volunteering it could be you have no clue I want to ask you about another one of your songs called Rise Up, which is all about fighting anti-Semitism. And you even reference authors like David Baddiel and Holocaust survivor Elie Wiesel. You wrote, I created the song with direction from a school teacher who said they were suffering an intense wave of anti-Semitism. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, I kind of got like, it was interesting. I, um, I was supposed to go perform this show. And then they just booked, they were like, could you make a song? And I'm like, okay, I'll make a song because I couldn't get to Canada. I was, I was running the New York City Marathon. And I was like, oh, I'll just make the song. This is great. And, uh, and I made this song and, and um, I really loved it. And yeah, I've been, I got David Radiel's book, I think, maybe coming home from Poland last summer. Um, actually, if, if or Germany, I'm not sure. Um, I... And I've been in touch with him briefly on, on Twitter and stuff like that. Um, and I'm like, okay, I thought that was a good follow-up also to the Kanye song, something in general, something that would be just well-received with lyrics and just rapping. And it was cool. Like, it wasn't, like wasn't going to be the big viral thing. Um, I knew that. And I just wanted to make something to follow up from the Kanye thing, which was so controversial that wasn't like, Hey, we're going to make a Hanukkah song now. You know what I mean? It's just like, yeah. what are you releasing at? What's the follow up? People were like, what are you following up with Kanye? Is there another Kanye song? You know? So that was like, that was the follow up. And, uh, yeah, I really liked the song and I don't, like I said, I don't like to make these sort of anthems for, you know, these specific songs because there's like the places that I could perform the rise up song are more like in an educational sphere and a rap show. Mm. Yeah. Um, maybe for a, an event or a parade or for Israel, you know, I don't know. Um, but yeah, as a school teacher, was, I had long conversations with this woman, um, Lisa Leviton, shout out to her. And she was, yo, she's like, I really need um, somebody to help. We need people like you. And like I said, that song, the Kanye diss track, Death Con 3, traveled to so many locations around the world people just reaching out from everywhere so it's just cool that by standing up for something that felt authentic to me is that it it helps it speaks to other people around and helps them to speak up in whatever way that may be whether they're creating an event or or a song or a podcast newsletters etc that's that's awesome, man. And when you're like writing these songs, are you speaking from? Uh, are you drawing upon personal experiences of anti-Semitism? 
yeah, I mean, I've had tons of, tons of experiences. Um, and, you know, also speaking on daily occurrence, like, you know, I was, I was at when the guy got beaten down in, in New York at that rally, uh, Joseph, oh, yeah. uh, in New York, like I was just right there. I saw the people that did it and got arrested. And I was just like, there, it was like one block away. You know what I mean? There was just that time at, and I was like, all right, it's May, it's pandemic, we're going to war. I'm like, I'm just going to go to these rallies and uh, and be out there. I mean, I went to every other rally. I went to all the other rallies that weren't for us. Um, so I was like, I'll go to this one. But just for my personal experiences, like, um, you know, I've had people, I just want to give specific things. So somebody, I remember being at a show, somebody doing Hitler salute, people being on stage on like Free Palestine, which is fine. It's just, I seeing them doing it during my show. And this is like across you know, protests at like Hillel events. Um, and then the biggest thing is, you know, it should be noted that like Jewish people saying, oh, it's too Jewish and not really wanting to do anything with it. And people that could have are supposedly your friends, but you know, they're afraid to get associated from what other people might think about them. So, um, and that has yeah. happened to me consistently with the name Kosha Dills, um, uh, throughout time. And, um, you know, with some of the biggest people that I'm not going to name, but it's really, really, really sad, you know, that that happens. And honestly, the coolest thing is that where it hasn't happened is, um, I mean, you know, a while then out, you know, it's like an opportunity for me to, I don't even really wear a keeper like that, but on that show, because people just think you're either white or black, like you just almost have to identify as like whatever you kind of are. Like, this is the big guy. This is the skinny guy. This is the Asian girl. This is the Jewish guy. This is, this is the short right. dude, you know? So, so everyone's like this sort of thing, a part of a television show, you know? So, uh, and you just have to be good. And that's the best part about the show is you have to be great. When, when, correct me if I'm wrong, but earlier when you were talking about heckling and booing and how it can be a good thing, I feel like you were talking about it from the perspective of meritocracy and whether it's someone is a, deemed a good rapper or a trash rapper or whatever. Do you draw a line between that and blatantly anti-Semitic booing and heckling? Yeah, because I'll never get booed for being whack because I'm dope. That's just a, <laughs> that's just, that's just a fact. Yeah. Um, you know, you know, I'll never, I'll never get, it's that business to hate, that is like haters, but you know, I know that, uh, yeah, nowadays that's the only way you're going to get booed really, you know, I pretty much, you know what I mean? Um, I mean, you know, you could get booed or get silent in music, but maybe in, in music, but in comedy, you could get booed for sure just for not, you know, killing yeah. it. But, you know, music to have the booze, it's been, I guess it's been a while, but I've definitely gotten anti-Semitic booze before throughout my career. Yeah. I feel like we glossed over the Nazi salute way too quickly. Yeah, that was so, and it was like, oh, it's a joke. I remember that. I was in Kansas City. I was in Kansas City. And that guy reached out. Yeah, and it just, you know, and that's like the um, the lack of awareness of what is funny and what is not. You know, I'm all for a good, uh, yeah. I'm all for a good joke. Really. I really am. <laughs> I really am. But I remember that. And I was like, hmm. Noted. I, I think a lot of people need, like, they would benefit from just being taken aside and very gently just be like, dude, that wasn't funny. <laughs> that wasn't cool. Yeah. And when, when I get the opportunity to have conversations with some people, but some people will just never learn. And then you look down the line of people that do that have all kinds of other issues. Anybody who's doing yeah. those jokes or really have a whole other slew of things going on. So it's really like not about Jews, you know, it's about them. Yeah. 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 Um, let me ask you about a recent song, not so with antisemitism. It's called Havarim and you rap almost entirely in Hebrew. Uh, can you tell us a bit about the song and why, why you made that choice? Yeah. Um, to be honest, I was like, 2019 I was living in Israel 2019 to 2020 right before the pandemic and I was like really just on my quest with Hebrew I was in Ulpan every day um I uh mentally I was not in a good place I mean I was like I took myself off like medication medication and like um I remember I was just going through like a lot of change and I was like really obsessed with a specific person and I was like I'm gonna make a song about this person this woman and I'm not going to write them in English, so I'm going to write them in Hebrew. 
da 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 da. So I wrote a bunch of songs in Hebrew, and I'm like, okay, I'm just like navigating, sort of communicating in Hebrew, and that was like a huge part of uh, a lot of, and this is something that a lot of people have. I don't say Jews around the world have. Um, is there's like uh, there's like some shame, especially with uh, Israel and not speaking Hebrew or um, not. Uh, and I had that a lot in my family, just of being the first one born in America and not really, you know, living in Israel. And everyone in my family lived in Israel except me and really not feeling Jewish enough, not feeling Israeli enough. And, you know, and just using this person as like the, uh, the catalyst to like make this stuff. Um, you know, and you, once you go to Israel, a lot of times there's people like, oh my God, you did Aliyah, you did, made it. And, you know, I was already a citizen. I'm already a citizen of Israel. But, you know, feeling like you're just not too much this, not too much that, but still being able, to, but really getting the respect of like Israeli producers and rappers and being like, wow, you're dope and you're killing it. And it's really an honor to work with you. So that's why I made the song. It really had nothing to do. Chavarim is like, where are all my friends? Where are my friends? I was alone. And essentially, like, where I want to get to with my music is I want to make music for Rami. And it's not the Kosher Dills thing is great, <clears throat> but I'm really trying now. My artistic, <clears throat> my artistic quest, my artistic quest uh, is really trying to dig deep to, to bear my soul to people so I could have, like, to, to really understand who I am <clears throat> to connect with me. Because the Kosher Dills thing is blown up. And the Kanye thing was cool and a lot of things, but you know, until an artist really gets real, so you really have a true connection. And the thing is, you know, connecting through music, through anti-Semitism <clears throat> is sustainable, but to what degree, no one's really like rocking to that in a car, you know, maybe in educational formats and like, oh, it's kind of cool. But you know, if all your favorite music is probably the cool rock band, you know, if you're living in England, you're like yeah. thinking of a British rock, I don't know strokes of this the, i don't know anything you know the smiths you know um the beatles you know you just want to make great songs and i really loved playing that song and i played that song the first time before the pandemic and when my friend passed away actually from an overdose and i was going to think where are my friends where are my friends um it's talking about calling people when you're like down really and that was what i was going through and you know i made a couple other songs and I want to release them, you know, I want to release them as Rami or Kosha Dills or whatever. Um, but the fact is, I want to put out stuff that's like more bearing of me. And that was one of the songs that was like it. But because it's Hebrew, people were still, and this is also, this is the twist, okay? This is for, for you guys. Just because it's Hebrew, people are like free Palestine, you know what I'm saying? Which is like, or they're saying, oh, you know, look at what you guys are doing. And that's essentially why I made it. Because the song has nothing to do. It has something to do with humanity. It's something to do with being lonely and fearful and obsessed and scared. Yet, it will still be like, oh, <laughs> screw you guys. You know what I mean? Just because it's Hebrew, right? Just because it's Hebrew. So that's kind of like the, the catch-22 in my art there. Well, look, I sincerely hope that this doesn't prevent you from making further songs in Hebrew because I really enjoyed it. I thought it was really refreshing and I look forward to seeing what more stuff you're going to put out. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to say that I did a film actually this past summer called um, Not Everything Has to Be So Serious and it's like a dark comedy involved with the Holocaust. Um, you wow. know, I shot it in Poland, shot it in Amsterdam and I uh, screened it once and it was so, 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 so... Uh, um, amazing. We did it at the Weizmann Museum, at the Philly Jewish Shorts Festival. Uh, just a show. It was like a surprise thing. I, I popped up and did it. And uh, a film is going to be a huge medium for me. I just wanted to, I, I, need, I need to be more comfortable with putting it out there. Just as like the journey of Rami. Um, I'm really excited about that artistic process and collaborating. I'm yeah, doing a lot of stuff uh, in the black and Jewish collaborative world uh, with an event series called Soul Vey. And that's going to be through, you know, art, through through music, but 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 strongly through film. And I'm I'm looking at alternative ways to bring Holocaust education to the forefront um, in just different mediums, Amazing. not not through going to see a speaker and this, trying to get you know survivors to act, to talk, to 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 do animations. And these are things that are just exciting to me because it's new. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm a little bit older now. So I'm just thinking for the next 20 years, I want to be, you know, really make my mark on humanity and history and the Jewish world, but the, the pop culture world and, and bring this up to, you know, higher notoriety. So. 
Fantastic. Yeah. Um, let me ask you, do you have any advice for aspiring Jewish rappers? Um, well, I want to not just do it for rappers, but uh, creators. First off, if you're going to rap, you need to be a good rapper. So it's like, you know, you have to expand the vocabulary and practice nonstop. This is just like if you want to be a baseball pitcher, you have to throw a baseball. If you want to play cricket, you got to hit the, you know what I mean, tennis, etc. If you're a Jewish creative um, in general, um, I want you to like just write, you know, and to record yourself on voice memos to hear how your voice sounds. Like, don't be scared and be like, hey, you know, talking just like this, right? That's like record it and don't care if three people hear it or seven people like it. And because that is a lie. And I can't, the only reason why I really truly believe it is because I was around before. I remember when we just had CDs and there was no streaming, you know, I remember like that time when your main goal was to sell CDs and now you sell t-shirts, you're selling shmatas, you know what I mean? Um, <laughs> so, so, uh, but create something and who cares if you have 30 followers, I still upload stuff that gets 50 views. And I also have uploaded stuff that has gotten, um, 2 million, you know, or 3 million, but, um, it's, it's just, uh, getting out of your own way, you know, and, and do, and I'll tell you, share with this. Somebody wrote, um, someone's once told me, if you want to write a book, um, write a bad book. Write your first book, be a, be a bad book. Because ideally, is you're not just going to write one book. You're most likely write multiple books. So write a bad book first and release the bad book. And, and I'm still trying to take that advice. But I'm going to put out a bad movie and then make great films. And like that's like my, you know, I put out music I don't think is the best. And it's still there. People still listen and it's fine. You know, maybe they'll find something else. So do that. Yeah. I look forward to seeing that bad movie. Um, nah. Let me ask you a question now. I'm going to ask you a question now that I ask all of our guests. Uh, Rami, if someone who is not Jewish approaches you and says that they want to help in the fight against anti-Semitism, where should they start? Um, I think just amplifying your Jewish friends' voices. I think, you know, sharing Jewish content to your, to your social media pages is like a real easy thing because I think that's what the people are most self-conscious of. Um, Maybe showing up to a, a, you know, and I think that's a big way just if you're young, all right? I think if you're older, um, try donate just if you, if you're, and if, pan to your strengths. If you have money, but you're socially awkward, which is fine. <laughs> I'm not saying I'm not socially awkward. I am. Um, donate some money if that's the easiest thing. You know, a lot of people want to be like, how do I help homeless people? But they're scared. You know what I mean? They give money to a charity. You don't have to be in the streets with people talk, you know, if that doesn't make you feel comfortable, there's no right way or wrong way to help. But the conscious effort you make in helping someone is, a, is beautiful. You know what I mean? So like we need, we need allies. We always need friends. And it's nice that maybe you could tell somebody else that, you know, we need more collaboration, essentially. That's how the world comes together, you know? Mm -hmm. And at this point, I would like to remind listeners that if they do want to donate, they can go to antisemitism.org forward slash donate. Uh, now, uh, please, before we sign off, remind the listeners, what have you got going on? What have you got coming up? And where can people find you? Um, beautiful. Well, um, currently on a... Uh, on uh, Wild and Out, if you're in the USA, I have, have I post clips, but it's also on VH1, Paramount Plus, and uh, we're going to be recording in Atlanta for BET, um, which is really exciting for me to be because I was once on BET rapping in Hebrew, and now I'll be back, uh, you know, uh, a decade later. Um, I have uh, new music coming out, so Spotify is where you could find it. YouTube is a great place to see my music videos. Um, um, Ultimately, uh, you know, Instagram is a great place to see a lot of my street antics and, and like quick creation from sports videos to, you know, and I'm, I'm experimenting with a lot, you know, I do advice. I have a th something called 15 seconds of advice on my YouTube shorts that I just post every day. I don't know. It's, uh, but I'm, I'm hoping to continue writing articles and, and, uh, podcasts and trying to revive a podcast. I have a lot of creative ambition. I have an animation. I have a film. Um, I'm going to be at the Jewish festival in Krakow this summer. So that's great. And if nice. you're in New York city wow. for concerts, uh, or anywhere around the world, I announce it on a website called bands in town. Um, so you follow kosher deals there. Kosher is the website. And, uh, if you're interested in reaching out, 
please do um, on social media or my website. Um, you know, I don't know. There's a contact there. Say what's up. Say nice. hi. Yeah. Nice. Do it. That's plenty. Kosher Dills, thank you so, so much for coming on Podcast Against Anti-Semitism. Yeah, thank you so much. And one, I really appreciate your time, efforts, and the fight against anti-Semitism. And I love what you guys are doing.